As a biologist and a biology teacher, uh, I work with solutions almost all the time. On rare occasions, I've needed nothing more than a pencil and notebook when I've done studies in population biology, such as animal behavior or ecology. But for most laboratory work, in fact, all the laboratory work I've conducted in the last 10 years, I've needed some kind of a mixture of substances. Most often, it's come in the form of a solution. But I need to point out that not all mixtures are, in fact, true solutions. Some mixtures with which I've worked include milk, dishwater, more sophisticated solutions such as protein DNA solutions. I've worked with chromatography slurries, microbiological media, physiologically, physiological saline, and the like. Now, if a student was going to ask me, uh, Dr. Capret, define it, uh, a mixture, I would say it's a heterogeneous association of substances that cannot be defined by a single chemical formula. And that pretty much covers all the types of mixtures that we use in a laboratory. We tend to think of solutions and most mixtures as being in a liquid form. That isn't actually the case. Uh, mixtures can include liquids, solids, or gases dissolved in a liquid matrix. They can also include solids in solids, gases in gases, and various combinations of all these phases. Now, uh, what I'm going to talk about next is a formal definition of three general types of mixtures that have been recognized. Wilhelm Ostwald, uh, a German chemist, is known as the father of physical chemistry. In fact, he won the Nobel Prize in 1909 for chemistry. Ostwald is reported to have said, there are no sharp differences between mechanical suspensions, colloidal solutions, and true solutions. There was a gradual and continuous transition from the first through the second to the third. Regardless of what type of mixture we're discussing, we can describe a mixture as uniformly dispersed. Uh, what that means is that we have a major component, such as water in this particular cylinder, and a minor component, in this case it's a soil sample. And if we mix the two together, we have what we call, in this case, a suspension. The same is true in terms of major and minor components of a colloid or of a true solution. But there are some distinctions among them. As Ostwald said, the distinctions aren't terribly sharp, um, but uh, they can be defined in a couple of ways uh, by both the optical properties, the appearance of the, uh, of the uh, mixtures, and also in terms of their behavior. Uh, in a mechanical suspension, or simply suspension, we have particulate matter that is suspended in the major component. It settles out through gravity pretty quickly here. Uh, what defines uh, this particular mixture as a suspension is the fact that all of the particles uh, in this suspension, with the exceptions of the, one, of the ones that are making the water cloudy, uh, are um, macroscopic or at least visible in an optical microscope. And in fact, uh, the formal definition, the cutoff uh, in terms of a mechanical suspension is that the uh, materials composing the minor component have in their, are in their smallest dimension no smaller than about a micrometer. That is a millionth of a meter, one-tenth the thickness of a human hair. Uh, the um, some definitions of a suspension call for the particles to be even smaller uh, and uh, depends on whether or not they settle out. Uh, hence the lack of sharp distance, uh, differences uh, between, let's say, a suspension and a, and a colloidal mixture, such as a uh, coffee creamer, which I have right here. Um, in a colloidal mixture, you can put this thing in an optical microscope, take a look, and no matter what magnification, you cannot see the particles. They're too darn small. An electron microscope would reveal them, however, um, but the properties of a colloidal mixture, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, really point out the differences between what we call a colloid and what we call a suspension. On the other hand, we have a true solution. Aside from the clarity of this solution, they're very similar. We have uniformly dispersed material in a liquid. Uh, they don't settle out. Uh, they uh, appear to be uh, pretty stable this way, but there are some distinct differences between the two. Uh, one of the um, most important differences between a solution and a colloidal mixture is the fact that the interaction between the minor component and the major component uh, 
is at the molecular level. And it's molecular interactions that keep the materials dispersed in a true solution. It can be a bit difficult to distinguish between a colloidal system, such as coffee creamer, and a true solution, such as this uh, phenol red dye uh, in, in water. Examples of colloids include smog, which is not a liquid mixture at all, uh, milk, as I mentioned, even solids and solids, and even something as exotic as foam rubber. On the other hand, true solutions are characterized by a dispersion of, of materials at the molecular level, and there is interaction between the molecules of the minor component and the major component such that true solutions have distinct properties and behaviors from colloids. Now, suspensions, colloidal systems, and solutions differ in their behaviors in the laboratory, and this is one of the reasons that it's important to make those distinctions to students and to colleagues. If we take a suspension and mix it up, it may very well separate out again due to gravity alone. In fact, if we wash this thing for a little bit, we'll see the soil particles settle down. When we mix up a colloidal solution, or colloidal system as we call it, the particles remain dispersed. Gravity will not take them out of uh, the mixture at all. And the same is true for a true solution. Uh, but uh, even the behavior of true solutions and colloidal mixtures is different, although the difference is somewhat subtle. Now, uh, in the case of suspensions, once again, I'm going to go back over here to my tall cylinder. Uh, soil suspension settles out pretty quickly just under the force of gravity. That's because the soil particles, the sand, the clay particles, uh, some of the vegetable matter is uh, rather uh, large and uh, the force of gravity on those particles is much different than the force of gravity on the major component, that is the water. Uh, and in fact, uh, notice some of the particles actually float on the surface of water. The gravity pulls the water down with greater force than it pulls these plant materials which are full of air and are buoyant and float on the surface. But in any event, the materials, the minor component, can be separated due to gravity or due to forces uh, beyond the force of gravity. Uh, we can, in fact, um, demonstrate another kind of suspension, namely uh, whole blood. <coughs> I didn't bring any with me today. If you look on the slide, you'll see a, uh, an example of whole blood in a centrifuge tube. If we take that centrifuge tube containing whole blood and pop it in a centrifuge, we can generate much, much higher forces than we can get through gravity alone, and we can separate red blood cells uh, from the plasma. Sometimes casual observation alone isn't sufficient with which to distinguish a suspension from a colloidal system or even a true solution. Uh, gravity alone will not bring down suspended particles fast enough uh, if the particles are small enough. Uh, an example is with whole blood. If you let whole blood sit in a refrigerator for perhaps 24 hours, the uh, cells will settle to the bottom, and what they leave above them is uh, plasma, which is devoid of particulate matter. Uh, plasma, uh, in this case, is referred to as supernatant, being super above what we call the pellet, which is the actual cells that settle down. If we want to speed up the process, uh, we can pop our materials into what we call centrifuge. Centrifuge operates by uh, spinning the specimen at a very high speed. Uh, this particular one can produce forces uh, on the specimen that exceed 20,000 times the force due to gravity, uh, which brings down most sus suspended particles very quickly. Now this particular uh, model is intermediate between a simple tabletop centrifuge, which spins at relatively low velocities, uh, and what we call an ultra centrifuge, which spins at very high speeds and produces forces uh, up to 100 or even 200,000 times or more uh, times the, uh, the force of gravity. Now to operate a centrifuge, we place our specimen in a tube called a centrifuge tube, one of which just hit the, the floor. Uh, we pop 
tubes in opposite sides of the centrifuge uh, so that they're balanced, or, or the rotor, because so in order to balance them, because if the thing is imbalanced at those speeds, it'll probably damage the machine. We pop the thing in, snap it into place, and I'd better put that other tube in there. My apologies. Make sure it's not cracked. People can be injured with these things very readily if they don't balance them. We've had some near disasters in the teaching lab. We gently close the lid. And I'm not going to fire this up now, but we would simply press the on button, spin it for a set period of time. When we're finished, we open the instrument, pop out our tube. Suspended particles will be on the bottom in the form of a pellet, and on top is the superdatant, which is generally a solution or it might even be a colloidal system. Students often mistakenly refer to suspensions as solutions and they talk about centrifuging the solution. It makes so sense to do that because centrifugation won't bring down the minor components that are in a true solution. They won't bring down minor components that are in a colloid either because no matter how hard you centrifuge, uh, the, or, or no matter what velocity you use uh, in order to generate g-forces, and no matter how high the g-forces, even in an ultra centrifuge, colloidal particles aren't going to come down. They're of equal buoyancy with the solvent molecules themselves, and so the force acts with equal effectiveness on both the solvent molecules, the major component molecules, um, or the colloidal particles. I just mentioned that centrifugation will not bring down the minor components in a true solution. That isn't entirely true. It is true for a colloidal mixture. And that's because, as I mentioned, the force of gravitation on the particles in a colloidal mixture uh, act equally on the major component, on all components of a colloidal mixture for that matter, and so they don't separate out due to uh, gravity or due to centri centripetal force or any other, other kind of, of force on them. On the other hand, in a true solution, the molecules of the minor component can be of different density than the molecules of solvent, and in fact, if we spin long enough and hard enough, we can bring down the actual molecules that are interacting with the major component. Uh, that method, in fact, of ultracentrifugation uh, was used early on when we, used, uh, when we attempted to determine the masses of individual proteins. A true solution is composed of a minimum of two components. The major component, in this case it's water, is referred to as the solvent. And the minor component is referred to as the solute. A solution can contain more than one solute, as a matter of fact. And what distinguishes a true solution from the other types of mixtures is that the solute molecules interact at the molecular level with the molecules of the solvent itself. Now, we think of solutions, particularly in the biology laboratory, as being liquids. I'm going to set this down and point out, as a matter of fact, that uh, solutions can be made by mixing solids with solids. Uh, the atmosphere can be considered to be a solution in which the various gases are mutually soluble. The solute, or solvent if you, if you wish, in greatest proportion is nitrogen gas, uh, followed by oxygen and then carbon dioxide. And there's a certain amount of water vapor in the, in the solution as well. The uh, solvent, that we primarily use in biological science is, of course, water. And water has some very unique properties, which I'm going to talk about next. Water is perhaps the most versatile solvent known. If we were just discovering water now, if we weren't 80% water and somehow lived on a dry planet, and suddenly somebody discovered this substance, it would be regarded as the most exotic substance on the face of the Earth. It has incredible properties. Uh, one of the properties is that of surface tension. If we take something like ethyl alcohol and we place it on a flat surface, the molecules of the ethyl alcohol spread out and they form a thin film of liquid on top of the surface. If we do the same thing with water, it beads up, forms a nice little convex bead and stays that way until finally, due to gravity, it slips and spreads out over the surface. Not very many compounds have that property of considerable surface tension. And that surface tension is due to some unique molecular properties uh, of the water molecules. 
Uh, it's no coincidence that water is the solvent uh, that makes life possible. It's no coincidence, in fact, that life originated in the shallow seas. It's no coincidence that we're 80% water. Proteins, DNA, lipid molecules that make cell membranes are all designed to interact with water. Most biochemical reactions take place uh, in water and involve uh, water uh, molecules or the ionic products of water. The property of water that we call surface tension is due to the property of the water molecule that we call polarity. Now water molecules are in fact electrically neutral. Uh, there are just as many electrons orbiting the atoms that are compo comprise a water molecule as there are protons in the nuclei of the atoms, two hydrogens and one oxygen. However, oxygen has a tendency to hoard electrons. The electrons spend more time orbiting the oxygen atom than they do the two hydrogen atoms. Consequently, uh, the oxygen atom has a partial negative charge on it. It's just a little bit negative most of the time. And both of the hydrogen atoms are just a little bit positive most of the time. Now we know that like charges tend to repel each other. A positively charged atom will repel a positively charged atom. Electrons mutually repel each other. Unlike charges attract. Just as a sodium ion is attracted to a chloride ion, the oxygen atoms in water molecules are attracted to the hydrogen atoms in water molecules. That attraction actually produces temporary bonds that we call hydrogen bonds. It is hydrogen bonding that gives the water molecules the property of sticking to each other that in turn makes the substance water rather sticky and thus we have surface tension. The molecules are reluctant to come apart. There is structure in water. It takes energy to break apart that structure. Thus, if we introduce a foreign substance, we take a solute that doesn't work. It disrupts the hydrogen bonding of water, messes up the structure, and it does not go into solution. Substances that are soluble in water are the ones that interact, that take advantage of this hydrogen bonding, that fit into the system, so, in matter of fact, they produce a more stable structure than water and solvent or solute separately would produce. One of the most well-known solutions uh, is a solution that's based on sodium chloride. I mentioned already that sodium chloride regularly dissociates into sodium ions and chloride ions, with sodium ions bearing a positive charge, chloride ions bearing a negatively charged negative charge. Just as water molecules interact with each other on the basis of attraction of unlike charge, a sodium ion is attracted to the slightly negatively charged oxygen atoms of water, and chloride ions are, in fact, attracted to the slightly positive hydrogen atoms uh, in water. They fit very, very well into the hydrogen bonding structure of water, so well, in fact, that a solution of sodium chloride is much more energetically stable than water separated from solid sodium chloride. It would take a great deal of energy to separate, in fact, solvent from the solute when you have a sodium chloride solution. Now, the most common solutions that we use in biology are indeed aqueous solutions. Uh, they're not the only ones, though. Some materials, in fact, have to be dissolved in ethanol or even organic solvents. And that's based on the properties of the solutes. A nonpolar solute, such as a hydrocarbon chain, can't interact with water. It, uh, there are no, there's no imbalance or asymmetry of charge such that, it can, that such solutes can fit into the hydrogen bonding structure of water. Nonpolar solutes disrupt the structure of water. It takes energy to get them in. We have to physically mix them, and then they separate out right away. So we have to use other solvents for some of the more exotic compounds that we use in the biological laboratory. Uh, for the most part, I'm going to be talking about aqueous solutions. Those are the ones we use mostly. Uh, the principles that I talk about, though, also apply to other kinds of solutions that we might make up. Water is the solvent of choice for, for many biological solutions, if not most of them. We have to be careful about what kind of water we use, though. It's highly variable in quality. And we can use tap water for some purposes, scrubbing the floor, washing the dishes, washing our hands. Uh, but tap water is a variable quality. We don't know what's in there. Typically contains sediments, such as salt 
uh, deposits, uh, organic materials, it can contain organic solvents, it can contain deliberately added chemicals such as chlorine or chloramines or fluoride uh, molecules. Uh, and so really not knowing what's in tap water today versus yesterday versus tomorrow, we usually use a higher grade of water for solution making and other types of mixtures in the laboratory. Now one higher grade of water is distilled water. I think we're all kind of familiar with how a still works. Water is heated up, we evaporate, produce steam, the steam is then condensed and we collect the condensate and that is distilled water. Distilled water can still contain some organic solvents. Uh, it's very hard to separate organics which are also volatile and which come down with the distilled water. Another grade of water which is perhaps as high a quality if not higher quality than distilled is deionized water. A typical example of a deionized water system uh, is a home water softener. Uh, in that case there is a resin cartridge which accomplishes the exchange of ions so that metal ions and other contaminating charged particles are removed from the water and sodium ions are, are put in, in their place. Uh, the problem with soft water as we call it is of course that this uh, water becomes sodium rich. Uh, it's not really suitable for biological applications. In laboratory deionized water we typically use a series of resin cartridges and we exchange metal ions that are and other contaminating ions in tap water with hydrogen ions and hydroxyl anions uh, which are components of water. So we replace exotic ions, contaminating ions with water ions essentially and purify the water that way. There is a somewhat of a disadvantage to using deionized water. Uh, again there can be um, some organic residue that's not taken out of the tap water and the resins themselves can leach products into the, 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 uh, the result of the high quality water that we don't want in our solutions. The highest grade of water that we use in the laboratory is called 18 megohm water. And I'll explain what that means. Uh, the greater the quantity or concentration rather of contaminating ions, the greater the capacity of water is to conduct electricity perfectly pure water if we can generate it conducts electricity very very poorly. Uh, an ohm as we may know is, is a unit of electrical resistance. The higher the number of ohms of resistance the less the capacity of water or a conductor to conduct electricity. In the case of water it means the higher the resistance the fewer ions that are contaminating our water. We produce 18 megohm ion uh, water which is 18 million ohms resistance by running tap water through a series of cartridges. Those cartridges can include resin cartridges as we use for deionized, activated charcoal, filter beds and even a process we call reverse osmosis. The result is very 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 pure water. Now sometimes we want water of that purity and sometimes we don't. 18 megohm water is what we call aggressive the pH of pure water is around 5 and we know that neutrality is pH 7. Water is uh, at pH 5, uh, very aggressively solubilizes materials when it comes into contact with them. Uh, if you put 18 megohm water in a plastic jug, it leaches materials out of the plastic and brings them into solution. It leaches ions. Uh, so, uh, potassium primarily out of glass containers. Uh, any contaminant on the surface of a container will be absorbed, will be solubilized uh, by 18 megohm water. So if you're going to use 18 water, uh, megohm water, the best thing is to collect it fresh, pop it right into your container that contains solute and get something into that water right away. When we prepare 18 megohm water and we put it in a plastic jug, we're defeating the purpose. Of course I do that anyway the reason I do that is because I know what's in the plastic jug. I know my 18 megaohm water started off pure. At least I got rid of everything to begin with. And I don't need that level of purity for the kind of work I do. Generally deionized water will, will serve the purpose uh, and uh, even distilled water will serve the purpose. For most biology teaching labs, unless you're teaching cell culture or something that requires uh, a complete absence of possible toxins, those lower grades of water.